Hello. Good evening, everyone. Hello, everyone. I am so happy to see you. So this evening, I'm doing a live stream video to bring you in on the move of God right now. And I am so excited for what God is doing in this season, in these times, in this hour. And so this live stream is a part of the Ready to Receive Challenge. Um, with my Confident Woman community. Shout out to my Confident Woman community so that we can be ready to receive what God has prepared for his people. But if you're not in the Confident Woman community, it's okay because it's for the body of Christ regardless. So I am really excited to jump into this content tonight. Hey, everyone. It's so good to see you in the chat. Hey, Melissa. Hey, Havila. Hey, Shayla. Hey, Ariel. Bestie. Good to see you. Guys, I am so incredibly excited to jump into this content tonight. There is so much that the Lord is stirring in my spirit. Um, but before I jump in, I want to invite you to come to Confident Woman Weekend 2024. The theme for Confident Woman Weekend 2024 is the outpour. Okay, guys, we are almost sold out of the early bird tickets. Now is the time to get your ticket. It's going to be in Houston, Texas. And... God is going to meet us in an incredible way. So I wanted to invite you to come to the Outpour Confident Women Weekend 2024, August 30th and 31st this year. Husbands can attend. You can bring your husbands. Our last conference, husbands sat in and it was amazing and they loved it too. So feel free to bring your husband. They're like a free plus one. All right. So I am super excited to jump in. I love you guys talking in the chat. I love being able to see what you guys are going to say. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and get us kicked off in prayer. Father, I thank you so much that you love us, that you're for your people. God, I pray that you would give us the mind of Christ. I pray that you give us eyes to see what you're doing in this season. God, we ask that you would take off all of the blinders anything that has given us blurry vision, that we have not been sharp in the spirit. Lord, I pray that you would remove the scales right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that if there's anything muffling our ears, if there's anyone even saying, I'm not sure if I, I know what the Lord is doing right now. I'm not sure if I hear the voice of the Lord. God, we ask that you would take that barrier off right now in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, I ask that they would be able to hear your voice clearly. Your scripture says, my sheep know my voice and they don't follow the voice of a stranger. So God, I pray that as we prepare for your outpour, you would speak. Speak on this live call and speak to the body of Christ. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, A. Amen. 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 Kamisha, I miss you too. It's so good to see you. Guys, I am telling you, I have so many notes. I'm like, I don't know how long this call is going to be, but all I'm going to say is just get ready to dig in because it's some, it's some, some serious stuff. Okay. So if you see me reading, I have a lot of notes to cover, a lot of scripture, a lot of world events, a lot of what the spirit is speaking to me and throughout the body of Christ right now. And so first, I'm going to start with the premise of the outpour. If you follow me on Instagram, if you're on my email list, if you've done my challenges, you know I've been talking about the outpour, and it is a theme for this year. I believe throughout the body of a Christ, it is a theme, and this is how the Lord dropped it in my spirit. So at the end of last year, I was preparing to host the Fresh Wind Challenge, and I do these challenges with my community, and I have... Uh, devotionals and everything. And as I prepare for these challenges, I have to consecrate myself. And so I'm fasting and I'm spending a lot of time in coffee shops because all of the devotionals I do are like just very intentional. I spend a lot of time studying before I even put words on paper and it requires so much of me to create. Um, and so I had been spending so much time with the Lord and I had also been spending so much time in prayer and in worship. And for my birthday last year, um, I got Bose headphones and it's probably the best gift I've ever gotten because the way these headphones take me into the secret place and take me to the throne room with the Lord is just unreal because I can block out the world and just lose myself in worship with God. And so at the end of the last year, just this deeper desire for worship really welled up from that place in preparation for this challenge. And I, I was just spending so much time in God's presence 
it was overwhelming actually. And I've had some incredible counter encounters with the Lord, but it felt so refreshing after what felt like, if I'm being very honest, a, a year that felt a little bit more on the dry side. It felt so good to feel God again. I was feeling his manifest presence in the car. I'm bawling my eyes out. I'm losing it in coffee shops as I'm preparing for the challenge. I'm just overwhelmed by how God is so good and how much he loves us and how he'll meet us with his manifest presence. Even just thinking about it just makes me emotional because I'm like, God just wanted to meet me in a secret place. Nobody else knows. And there was such a deep outpouring. I, I feel his presence. I am just bubbling up in the spirit. I'm bubbling up in worship. And um, so it was towards the end of that challenge. I, I, I just finished writing a devotional and I'm driving home. And as I'm driving home, I'm deep in worship. And I hear the Lord say, the outpour. And immediately I was just taken up in the spirit and overwhelmed with that word the outpour. God didn't need to give me any context for that word. I didn't even ask God what the theme for my conference is going to be. I didn't even think to ask him yet. I hadn't even gotten that far yet, but I immediately knew God is saying in the same way that I've been meeting you with my manifest presence, I want to do that to a greater measure with my sons and daughters. I want to sweep across the body of Christ with my manifest presence and I want to pour it out. And it's so far beyond anything I expected because my last conference, the theme for it was in him. It was very simple. It was, okay, everything's about Jesus. It's all about him. It's all about being rooted in him. And so I just didn't have an, an, an anticipation for something so specific. And so I immediately sought the Lord on this word, the outpour. Um, and so whenever I asked him, of course, I did a lot of study, uh, but first I just asked him. And so whenever I asked him, I said, God, what is the outpour? And he was saying, I'm pouring out my spirit daughter like never before. And when I heard him say like never before, it was hard for me to get with the program and truly believe that because I'm like, how are you going to pour it out like never before, God? Like this is this is unprecedented. Like that's a big statement. And I said, um, why, why like never before? He said, because they will be fresh. This is fresh. This pour will be for what I have next for the church. And in that moment, it made sense to me because this isn't something he's poured out before for earlier times in the church. This is a fresh pouring out for what he has next for the church. He said, equipping them for battle, empowering for war. They will have spiritual sight. They will hear my voice again. They will feel me move again. I am with my people. And they need to know it. Some of you have felt like God has abandoned you. He's saying, I am with my people and they need to know it. This will be a fresh encounter with me. I will pass through them with my manifest presence. They will experience my nearness with fear and trembling, but they will know that I am their God. They will be thankful for my fire and grateful for my living water because they know that my fire will not burn them and my water will not drown them. That's so prophetic. My fire will refine them and my water will replenish them. I'm drawing my people to myself. As the days are darkening, my fire is burning. It begins as an ember and becomes a flame. The outpour of 2024 will be like a match that's lit in a forest. It will slowly grow until it is an, an uncontrollable fire. I will revive my people and I will destroy the works of darkness. I, I, my light will bring restoration, hope, healing, infilling, and deliverance. When he was saying this, I just felt such an overwhelming joy, and I just couldn't get enough of this. And I asked the Lord, why do we need this outpour? Why do we need it, God? And he said, you'll need it for the days ahead. I just want to I want to say that loud and clear. You'll need it for the days ahead. If you get nothing else out of this video, I'm going to dig into a lot of scripture. I'm going to dig into a lot of prophecy. I'm going to dig into a lot of stuff. But if you get nothing else from this video, you will need the outpour of God's spirit for the days ahead. Store up on God's spirit. He says, I'm showing you light and darkness. I'm showing you the battle in the heavenlies. 
There is a great spiritual war taking place and my people need to be equipped for it. And how are we equipped? We are equipped by the spirit. He said, those who receive my outpour and retain my oil, they will endure to, they will endure and be victorious. And this was a, a, the la- some of the last part of what God shared with me. He says, my people need to see with spiritual eyes. I don't know about you guys, but the spiritual world is so much more evident now than ever before. I would say in our generation, in our time, because it's always been there, but there's been this veil of people who are blinded to it. It's not that deep. I don't know about all of that. And now it is so obvious and in your face, you cannot deny the battle that's taking place in the heavenly versus light and darkness, good and evil. And so we need to be able to see with spiritual eyes, not just what the enemy is doing, but what God is doing. God said, many are being overtaken because of their ignorance and blindness. I'm equipping my people to fight so they are not victims to the enemy's schemes. I'm arming my people with weapons and I'm equipping them to fight. I'm pulling back the arrow and aiming it with precision. When I release it at the appointed time, my people will strike. I'm gearing up for a victory of the centuries. And when I heard that, I was like, God, I'm afraid to record what you said. Because that is a big claim. Gearing up for the victory of the centuries. He said, my people will be victorious. My people will be victorious. My people will be victorious. Now, I would be remiss not to share this scripture with you. Um, the scripture was relevant in Joel. It was relevant in the early church with the in the book of Acts, and it's still relevant today. And so I'm going to read it to you. And it's also encompassing the premise of the outpour. Acts 2, 17, it says, and it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all people. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my servants in those last days, both men and women, and they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The scripture makes it pretty evident that this outpour that God is sending in the last days is for preparation before the day of the Lord. If he's pouring out his spirit on his sons and daughters in a greater measure, first of all, we need to be ready to receive it and postured to receive it and say, God, I'm not going to despise prophecy. God, I'm going to pay attention to your voice. I'm not going to be able to open up. I'm not going to fear opening up my mouth and speaking if you're putting the words in my mouth. I'm I'm going to pay attention to the dreams that you give me, God. I'm going to pay attention to the visions that you give me, God, because I'm not going to overlook what you're doing in me right now. I'm going to be faithful with this outpour that you're giving me, God. And in that, we know that it's the last days and we know that it's preparation for the day of the Lord. So let's table that for a little bit because I'm going to dig into the day of the Lord in just a moment. So I did a study on outpour, right? I did a study on outpour. I'm like, God, I need to know a little bit more about this. And whenever I studied the word outpour in scripture, what I found is that biblically, just based on numbers, when God pours out throughout scripture, it's usually with judgment and wrath. And when I saw that, I was shocked. I'm over here looking at pour out, outpour, pouring, pour, oil, rain, water, flow. So much of it, the majority of pouring out in scripture from the Lord, not all of it, but the majority of it is judgment, is wrath. In fact, the first time that God ever poured out water from the heavens in scripture was in the story of Noah's Ark whenever he poured out judgment and destruction because the people in that day were so wicked and so evil. And so the thing about 
the story with Noah's Ark is, is many times we don't see the greater picture in the story of the Bible. Because every every passage of scripture in the Bible feeds into a greater overarching narrative of Jesus. And everything points back to Jesus. Even the story of Noah's Ark points back to Jesus. So with this first outpouring from the heavens, this is the first time it rained. It was a flood and it was a flood of judgment, judgment on the wicked. In this flood, well, I'll say first, before I get into that, I'll say this. This is a picture of two things. The first is it's a picture of the gospel. But second, it's a picture of God's faithfulness. I think that if we look at it with a very narrow mind, I forget that <laughs> I forget that that is the balloons. If we look at Noah's Ark with a very narrow minded perspective, we can think God is just an angry God. But this is a picture of God's it's a picture of the gospel and it's a picture of God's faithfulness. First, let's talk about how it's a picture of the gospel in the flood. The wicked died and the righteous one who's Noah was spared. God showed mercy on the one who was obedient and considered righteous in his sight, him and his family, him and his household. The wicked died and the righteous one was spared. Jesus said in Luke 12, 49, I came to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already set ablaze, but I have a baptism to undergo and how it consumes me until it's finished. You know, it's pretty interesting that Jesus says he has a baptism to undergo because here in this passage of scripture, he's already been baptized. He's talking about a water baptism. He's referring to salvation. He's referring to the cross because Noah's Ark is a picture of the cross. In 1 Peter 3, 18, it says um, that the flood and Noah's Ark corresponds to baptism. So that's another form of support that even being saved by water that 1 Peter 3 talks about corresponds to baptism. And Jesus is saying, I have a baptism to undergo. He's talking about his crucifixion. Let me explain. In the life of Jesus, the wicked men who should have been crucified. I, I don't want you guys to miss this. I don't want. So just really catch this. Okay. In the life of Jesus, the wicked men who should have been crucified were spared. And the righteous person, Jesus, died. So it was flipped upside down. So in the story of Noah's Ark, the righteous person was spared and the wicked died. But in the story of Jesus, Jesus did not escape the outpour of God's judgment. Jesus did not escape that, that, that baptism of judgment. He took on the form of flesh and God's wrath was poured out entirely on Jesus on the cross. So instead of us, wicked people, dying in the waters of God's outpour of wrath, Jesus died in the waters of God's outpour of wrath so that we could be wicked people, <laughs> wicked people who survive God's judgment. And we get to go out scotch free like Noah because we are resting in the ark of Jesus. How powerful is that? And he calls us pure because all of that condemnation was poured out on Jesus. Y'all, the gospel is so powerful. He took all of our condemnation so that we could be free. God took our place so that we can experience mercy. And I don't know about you, but lately I've just had such a deeper sense of my sin and how much I need God's mercy. Oh my goodness. So in it is mercy and he's showing his faithfulness. So here's how it's showing, here's how it's a picture of God's faithfulness. For the people of God, for those who seek his face, God always gives them the upper hand. Because I'm going di to dive into some things for some of you guys, you get a little freaked out by like end times prophecy and things like that. I just want to give you this level of assurance. The story of Noah's Ark not only shows the gospel, but also shows God faithfulness because for the people of God, for those who seek his face, he will always give them an upper hand. 
We're never going to just be out here not seeing anything that, that is to come because he pours out his dreams. He pours out his visions. He pours out his prophecies. He gives us time to prepare. You know, scholars believe it took Noah between like 55 to 75 years approximately to build the ark. So if you think about it, that's 50 years, 50 plus years to prepare himself and his family to survive the outpour of God's wrath. So some of you, you literally fear the days to come because you don't believe that the Lord would prepare you. You are a son. You are a daughter. The Lord will prepare you for everything that is to come if you would listen to his voice and heed his voice. He always gives the children of God an upper hand. That should give you confidence. He'll give you enough time to prepare. When we belong to God, we don't have to fear the plan of the enemy. And we also don't have to fear God's wrath upon us because Jesus already took the wrath for us. If we seek him, he is faithful. He will show favor upon his people and give us a heads up and divine strategy. So the rest of the world may undergo an outpour of destruction. The rest of the world may undergo it, but it's the outpour of God's grace. It's the outpour of his favor that will set us up for victory. So I'm going to pause there for a moment because I have more to share about the outpour personally. I wanted to share that little tidbit about, um, about Noah's Ark and Jesus and baptism. But I want to share with you a vision that the Lord gave me recently. So I was recently at a, um, I was recently at a retreat. And in this retreat, I was receiving from the Lord partially, but I was also thinking about all the things I needed to get done. And at the very end of the retreat, uh, one of the people who was leading the session, they said, okay, we're going to take this opportunity to pray and just be led by the Holy Spirit in any way. And so I have this idea in the back of my mind because I had been praying for people throughout the weekend that the Lord is going to put someone on my heart. So I close my eyes, I tune my ear, and I hear the Holy Spirit say, I'm going to speak to you. I'm going to speak to you. And I'm like, I had an assumption about what he was going to speak to me about. I'm thinking he's going to put somebody else on my heart to pray for so that I could be, you know, present to them. But I was shocked when all of a sudden I get a vision. And the first thing I see is my hands cupped like this. And it's like cupped in the shape of a heart, almost. Cupped in the shape of a heart. And my hands are filling up with water. I don't know where the water is coming from. But my hands are filling up with water. And I remember thinking, oh, wow, like my hands are getting pretty full. And my hands got to about 80% full of water. Like the, the last little tip of it wasn't filling up. And I remember wondering to myself, man, could, could God really, is he, could he? I feel like he can, but like, is he actually going to fill up my hands to the full? Is he actually going to do it? And it stayed in that part of the vision for a while. I just see water droplets, like the size of raindrops. It's just not a whole lot. And I'm like, man, I'm grateful for this fullness, but is he actually going to do it? And I'm just in this vision. Don't even realize I'm having a vision yet, but I'm in the vision. And then suddenly in the vision, more water pours out and it's finally to 100%. But just as fast as it got to 100% is when it started filling over. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I actually don't even have enough room to receive everything in my hands right now. And so in the vision, boom, a bucket appears, appears underneath me. And so the water is pouring out. It's pouring out. And anything that's like overflowing into my hands is just like filling into the bucket. And so after a while, I just like let it all fall into the bucket. And I remember thinking to myself, I never thought or even believed fully that God would pour this out to such a great degree. I didn't know he would give me this much. And I just thought to myself, okay, well, I, I, I want to immerse myself in it. So I'm like trying to squeeze myself into the bucket. And I'm like, this bucket's too small for me. And I'm like on some dock, like by a lake. And then after that had been a while, there was kind of just like a little phasing out. I'm like, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Boom. The vision jumps. I'm in a lake from my neck down, immersed in water. 
I see nothing around me but water and waves. And I'm thinking to myself, this is far more abundant than I ever thought possible. I never thought that the Lord would ever send an outpour this abundant. This is beyond my wildest imagination. And I'm swimming and I'm swimming. And I'm like, I didn't know I could be swimming in this outpour. And just when I thought it was over, I'm in the lake and then it starts to rain. It was like the cherry on top. I didn't know I could be swimming in the lake and this outpour be so intense that he would even send rain. And I was overcome with emotion. And I, you know, I'm like realizing that I'm having this vision and I'm like crying because I'm like, God, you're so good. You're so faithful. You would do this for me. You would send this outpour. And then the final part of the vision is other people started jumping in with me. And so with this vision, God is showing just the, the level of faith that we generally have. And, and even me, it was, it was personal, right? There's a level of faith that we generally have. And God is saying, I can do so much more than that. There is an abundance of my spirit. There is an abundance of my presence. There is an abundance. If you would just ask, you'll see what I can do. I said I was sending an outpour. And when I said I was sending an outpour, I didn't want you to think I could just fill your hands 100%. I didn't want you to think I could just fill a bucket. I didn't want you to think I could just fill a lake. When I said I'm sending an outpour, I said I'm sending an outpour. It's not just going to be enough for you. It's going to be enough to where however many people want to jump in, they can jump in too. This is a move across the body of Christ. This is not about Amanda Pittman. This is an outpour. If you can receive individually where you are in the spirit from the Lord, this is going to become an overflow of our intimate time with the Lord. I am speaking revival. There's going to be a revival across the body of Christ. It's going to be so abundant. People are going to start jumping in, jumping in, jumping in. And it's your responsibility to first ask and receive personally, in your own time with the Lord, it's going to be an overflow, an overflow abundance. Some of you, there's going to be land released. Land. You're taking new territory. Some of you, God is going to pour out kingdom strategy on next steps so that you can prepare for the times ahead. Some of you, it's financial. And God's saying, I'm sending an outpour. When I said I'm sending an outpour, I'm sending an outpour. Some of you, you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And God is saying, you are going to feel my manifest presence and you're going to know that I'm God and I'm going to pour out my spirit on you. For some of you, you've never seen miracles, signs, wonders. Some of you, you've never seen demons cast out. He's saying, you are going to see my healing. You're going to see my miracles. You're going to see my deliverance. You're going to see my signs and wonders. Some of you have even been praying for family members. You thought these family members would never come to know the Lord. God's saying, it's abundant enough for your family member too. There's enough outpour for everybody. Jump in, jump in, jump in in faith. It's our job to be postured and ready to receive the outpour. So I wanted to share that with you. The other thing I wanted to share before I jump into a little bit more scripture, a lot of prophecy, there's a lot to cover. But before I do that, I also want to share one piece of uh, one last piece of outpour that the Lord has been doing in my heart. So it was maybe a couple weeks after the Lord spoke the word outpour for the conference and for this year. And I was so stirred up in the spirit, spending so much time in worship. And there was one day I'm going to the dermatologist and I'm enjoying just driving by myself, no kids. I'm just by myself and I'm blasting worship music to the, just as loud as it can go. And I'm just singing, crying out to the Lord saying, Yahweh, Yahweh. And just out of nowhere, I had just parked. I parked and I saw, I said, God, we are here for, here for the outpour of your grace. It just flowed out of my spirit. That's never happened to me ever in my life, where a song just flowed out of my spirit in worship. And I knew right then and there, the Lord saying, I need you to get into a posture of worship and usher my sons and daughters into a posture of worship. They need It needs to be a prayer of their heart. This wasn't something I conjured, okay? This was a heart song that poured out of my spirit. A, a genuine cry of the Lord, I need your outpour. 
It needs to be an outpour of your grace. And so from that, in faith, I'm like, God, I'm going to partner with you in faith. And he told me, I want you to release the song. And, and he was very specific about the timeline. April 4th. It's got to be April 4th. And God's heart behind it is worship. It's worship. It's not just a song. It's worship. It's a prayer. It's a heart song. It's an anthem for us to get prepared for what God is about to do within the body of Christ. What would it look like with throughout the body of Christ, throughout America, throughout Argentina, Africa, China, all over the world, people are singing, God, we are here for the outpour of your, gra your grace. Pour your spirit on your sons and daughters. Pour it out, God. We want revival. We want to see you move like never before. I truly believe that God will respond to his people if we're unified and asking him for the outpour. And he's faithful to give us just that. And so I'm so excited in just two days, we're releasing the outpour and I cannot wait. It is the most beautiful song and it was birthed by the spirit through the spirit. Um, and, and God has been woven into every single detail. The last piece I'll say on that is the day that we recorded it in the studio um, it's so funny because that morning it was trickling raining and me and my best friend, Avriel, were like, oh, you know, uh, our hair, we got to cover our hair and, you know, we're taking a video. I don't want to mess with my hair. And it was a part we were just running a certain part over and over and over. And we we're saying, pour it out, pour it out. And we're saying, pour your glory, pour your power. And we just kept chanting, pour it out. And then me and my friend were like, OK, we got to pee really quick before we record. So we go to the bathroom and I look outside and it is pouring out cats and dogs, raining cats and dogs. I'm like, this is not what it was like in the morning. It is raining heavy right now. It is so prophetic. God is saying, no, I'm in this. I'm on this. And in the same way in your vision, you saw the trickles and then there was the outpour. God is sending the outpour. And so I just want you guys to get excited about it. Get excited to worship to it. Get excited to worship your God and be expectant for that. Okay, so let's dive in a little bit more. So I shared with you, when it comes to this pouring out that Acts 2 talks about and even that Joel talks about, it says it's in the last days that God's going to pour out his spirit. And so I can make the argument that we are living in the last days. I just want to be very clear about that. We are living in the last days. Therefore, we will need God's power in greater measure for both the judgment of God and for the harvest. We're going to need his outpour to withstand God's judgment and also so that we're ready for the harvest. And when I say harvest, I mean souls. Because if, if God's pouring out a spirit, that means a lot of people are about to start getting saved. So we need to be ready. We need to have oil stored up. We need to have our Bibles ready. We need to have our Bibles memorized. Some of you guys need to go ahead and buy yourself a Bible, like a physical Bible. Like I like had recently, I don't know, like last year lost my Bible. And I was like, oh, I can, I can just use my Bible app, whatever. No, I needed my physical Bible. I bought my physical Bible. I got myself a cute little Bible cover. Okay. I bought myself highlighters. I'm like, I always prided myself in not being that girl. I don't need all that with my time with God, but I'm saying, no, invest in your time with God. Eat the word of God. Consume it like it is your food. You'll need it for these last days when people will say, what do I need to do to be safe? You have that word stored up in your heart. When people say, you know, I don't know how to hear God's voice. You can turn to a scripture. You need to be ready in season and out of season. And I truly believe that there's going to be a time in the same way that they're starting to uh, censor uh, parental rights with, um, you know, sex changes and oh, certain things are actually intolerant. It's eventually going to become to where even owning a Bible or reading a Bible in public is going to be considered intolerant and hateful because they they truly believe that the God of the Bible is intolerant and hateful. And the truth is he's intolerant and hateful of sin, but he's merciful to his sons and daughters if we will repent. And so get your physical Bible because you're going to need it for the days ahead. That wasn't even in my notes, but I'm just like it needed to be said. We're living in the last days. The days are getting darker as the day of the Lord is approaching. And the day of the Lord is approaching. So let's talk about the day of the Lord. What is the day of the Lord? 
The day of the Lord is for punishment and judgment against evil. It's when God comes to judge the world, finally. And then the day of the Lord is also to establish order and authority and establish a new heaven and a new earth. This is when everything is made right. All of the evil is wiped clean, wiped clean and good and newness is established. It's when the fulfillment of things take place. And so Matthew 24 talks about the signs of the ends of the age. And you know that you're at the end of the age when you're approaching the day of the Lord. And many of these things have always been happening. And I think that's why a lot of people scoff at the Bible and they scoff at talks about the end times. It's because a lot of these signs have been happening, right? There have always been false prophets. There's always been wars and rumors of wars. What's new? There's always been persecution. What's new, right? But there are a few signs that are very specific that we need to pay attention to that do help us tell the times beyond that. And so one of those is in Matthew 24, starting in verse 15, and it's talking about the great tribulation. And so I'll read that to you. It says, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, because this is also mentioned in Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, this holy place is talking about the temple in Jerusalem, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. A man on the housetop must not come down to get things out of his house, and a man in the field must no, not go back to get his coat. Woe to the pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days. Pray that you that your escape may not be in winter or, or on a Sabbath, for at that time there will be great distress, the kind that hasn't taken place from the beginning of the world until now and never will again. Unless those days were cut short, no one would be saved. But those days will be cut short because of the elect. So this is talking about the great tribulation. This is a time of testing and a time of just very, very hard times as the day of the Lord is imminently close. And what do they say marks the time of the day of the Lord? When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place. Okay. A lot of scholars believe, the majority, overwhelming majority of scholars believe that this abomination of desolation is a false god and that it is the Antichrist. So when you see the Antichrist standing in the temple of Jerusalem, that's when you know stuff's about to go crazy. That's when you know stuff's about to hit the fan. That's when it's like, prepare because this it's, it's go time. It's go time. Um, and I'll also say that, okay, so what I'll say about that as well is that there have been two Jerusalem, uh, two temples in Jerusalem that have been built and both have been destroyed. The last time the temple was destroyed was in 70 AD. It was in 70 AD. And so a lot of people believe, in it, and I, I, it biblically stands, that if you want to know the times that we're living in, you have to look at what's happening in Israel. Because like I said, there's always been false prophets. There's always been wars and rumors of wars. But what will help you determine the times is what's happening in Israel. Okay, so like I said, there have been two temples built. The second temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So there is no temple in Jerusalem currently. But this destruction of the temple back in 70 AD was a type and shadow of what's to come. So in the same way that Noah's Ark was a type and shadow, so this is. So Noah's Ark was a type and shadow of, of Jesus, right? So was this, because Jesus was prophesying the destruction of the temple, and he was talking about his physical body. He was prophesying about it. It's a type and shadow. But many times in scripture, there is an immediate fulfillment of prophecy, which is the par partial prophecy. And then there is the later fulfillment of prophecy, which is going to complete and fulfill that prophecy. That's why we can see a lot of prophecy that has been fulfilled from the Old Testament, from, you know, Daniel and Ezekiel and, and, and Jeremiah. We've seen a lot of those that are fulfilled. And yet they've been fulfilled before, but so many believers still believe for the full fulfillment of that to come. That's why we can look at a scripture like Acts 2 and say, in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit. 
And we know that the spirit was already being poured out then because that was after the day of Pentecost. But we can say that was the partial fulfillment of that. And now we're awaiting the latter rains. Those were the former rains, the former outpouring of God's spirit. But now we're awaiting the latter rains. That was the partial fulfillment of the prophecy. But now we're waiting for the later fulfillment of that prophecy. And so that's also what's happening with these temples. Because there are a lot of things that are ushering right now, currently ushering in the construction of the third temple. And if the third temple is being built, then what must come? The abomination that causes desolation standing in the temple. And if the abomination that causes desolation is standing in the temple, that means it's the Antichrist. And he's going to start ushering in the new world order. And so let me tell you guys just a little bit about the times that we're living in, in terms of the construction of this temple and how people are truly pushing it. Jews and Christians alike are banding together. And even Muslims are banding together to get this third temple rebuilt because of their religious beliefs. So Jews believe it's going to usher in their Messiah because they, Jews don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Other, otherwise, they would be Messianic Jews. Orthodox Jews are still awaiting their Messiah, and they think that their Messiah is going to come with the construction of the third temple. Christians believe that with the construction of this third temple, the Antichrist is going to come and stand in that temple, and that's going to usher in the second coming of Jesus, and you know he'll just rapture us. And so people are just banding together. They want to get this, this temple built. Um, and, and here's how we know that there are a lot of updates happening surrounding the, th the third temple in, in Israel. There's peace between Saudi Arabia and Israel. So even the, there was a Jerusalem post that said Saudi Arabia and Israel are con conducting negotiations to allow Saudi representatives to join the like the Jerusalem Islamic religion, religious trust that controls the Temple Mount. That's significant. So essentially, Muslims. And Jews are teaming up. They're getting together as one. And this may happen within the third temple. So what does that say to us? Well, this likely, if we truly believe that there's going to be an abomination that causes desolation in this third temple, like the scripture talks about, and both Jews, Orthodox Jews, not Christians, but Jews and Muslims are banding up to do this. That means that the Antichrist is going to stand there and usher in a new world order. And with the new world order is a one world religion. So it would make sense for Jews and Muslims to be banding together because there's a one world religion. Um, and the thing about a thing about the Antichrist, the scripture tells us that it demands to be worshipped. The Antichrist demands to be worshipped. So when you see someone demanding worship in that place, another thing that's happening that shows the times is red heifers. I don't know how up to date you guys have been with, with the red heifers, but Orthodox Jews believe that you need to have pristine, perfectly in pristine condition, red heifers in order to sacrifice and purify. So these red heifers, there haven't been, there haven't been many, like there are only nine slaughtered from the time of Moses to the destruction of the sec second temple. And these, the red heifers had to meet all these qualifications to cleanse the third temple in order to be used in the temple ceremony. And right now, they have five. I see, hello, Nawalzi just said it. They have five right now. They have five right now being ready. to. They're months away. And we don't even know. They could be sacrificing them right now as we speak, and we wouldn't know. But they have five right now ready to be sacrificed. And this is extremely rare as well. Like we don't understand how rare it is. Like I said, there was nine slaughtered from the time of Moses to the destruction of the second temple. And so it's Jewish tradition that believes that the Messiah will offer the 10th red heifer. And so this Messiah, we believe, will be the Antichrist. They have all the red heifers. They're getting ready to build this temple. And they believe he's going to be the one to sacrifice it, but they believe it's his, it's, it's the Messiah. And according to, um, yeah, just in time for Passovers. Yeah. I love that Ursula mentioned the red heifers as well. Um, so some of the things that the red heifers need, it has to be completely red. It has to never have worn a yoke in its life. 
Uh, the book of Numbers explains that the ashes of red heifers were used to purify priests for their service in the temple. And so it's a very significant time in Jewish history right now. Like I said, if you want to discern the times, you have to look at Israel. That's why I'm saying this outpour isn't just something that's like, oh, you know, I feel it because it's an election year. No, we're looking at Israel and they're about to, to build a, the third temple right now. Like it's, it's a really big deal. We're going to need it. And the ceremony of red heifers has to be performed on the Mount of Olives and it has to look directly into where the temple once stood. It has to have no blemishes. And that land, that land of um, that looks directly into where the temple stood has already been purchased and ready to use 12 years ago. It fits all of those descriptions. And so there are groups of people, Christians and Jews, even some Muslims who are really ushering this in and teaming up together. Um, and so there's this movement of Jews and they're rebuilding the third temple and they believe they're ushering in the Messiah. And there's a guy whose name's uh, like Rabbi Yitzhak Mamo. And he said, we have the priest, we have the red heifer, and we have the land, and we have everything ready. We even have the golden menorah. There's a menorah that's been crafted uh, according to First Chronicles so that they can worship the Lord the same way that they worshiped King David 3,000 years ago. They have everything and in, in back in 2015, they completed an altar needed to restart the sacrifices and to perform a reenactment of the Passover sacrifice. They have everything they need. And so why do I share all of this? I share all this to say this. When this happens, it will fulfill Bible prophecy. And it will fulfill Bible prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. A lot of other prophecy has been fulfilled. This has yet to be fulfilled, and it's in the works right now as we speak in 2024. These red heifers are probably going to be sacrificed within the next few months, guys. It's happening. It's happening. Bible prophecy, it's looking a lot like the book of Revelations out here. That's what I'm trying to say. And after that happens, we know that the Antichrist comes, and then the day of the Lord comes. Jesus pours out his judgment. He pours out his wrath. And then the new heaven and the new earth is ushered in. And that's not even counting signs in the heavens. Okay. Like, cause I haven't even dug into that yet. The signs in the heavens in just five days. Cause right now it's what today is April 2nd. There's going to be a solar eclipse over the United States on April 8th. So that's six days. We're just six days away from another solar eclipse. Josephine, I see you say, what is a new earth? So part of our hope of glory in belonging to Christ is that he gives us new bodies. We will be resurrected with him and we'll live with him. We'll, we're alive in these bodies, but also once we die or whenever, you know, Jesus comes back, we will be raised and we'll be resurrected and given new bodies. But in the same way, when Jesus comes back, he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth that's untainted by sin. So that's the new heaven and new earth. Back to April 8th. So all of these things are happening as well. There was another eclipse that happened back in um, 2017, and now it's 2023. And back in 2017, the eclipse had a shape going like this. And now in terms of the path of the eclipse, and now in 2024, seven years later, number of completion, it's going in the opposite direction, forming an X. There is an X being formed over the United States with these eclipses. And when you look at scripture, God mentions signs in the heavens telling the times. From the very beginning, let's look at Genesis. Genesis 1.14 says, and God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky. And guess what? They weren't, they weren't made first. Like God, God lit the heavens and the earth far before the sun did. And so you got to think, okay, then what's the purpose of the sun? Scripture tells us, let God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light to the earth. And it was so. 
And God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. And he also made the stars. So scripture tells us from the very beginning, the main, the main purpose of the sun and the moon and the stars was not to give light. That was its secondary purpose because God said, let there be light before he said, let there be, let there be the sun and the moon. The primary purpose of the sun and the moon and the stars is to tell the signs of the times. And we've gotten so used to not looking up. We've gotten so used to thinking that astrology and all of that is just woo woo for the world. Well, that's because they're de demonically perverting it. But we're actually supposed to discern the times that we're in by looking up, by looking at the sun and the moon and the stars. Did you know that they found Jesus, the wise men found Jesus by looking at a North star? They were astrologers. They were able to discern that the Messiah had come because they followed the, the signs in the skies. And so these eclipses that are happening are significant, especially because the Bible talks so much about signs in the skies. And oftentimes when the day of the Lord is described in the Bible, it's accompanying with signs in the heavens. So we, we see this in Ezekiel. The prophet Ezekiel foretold the destruction of Pharaoh in Egypt saying, and when I extinguish you, I will cover the heavens and darken their, their stars. I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon will not give its light. Now we know that with Pharaoh in Egypt, that was another type and shadow of Jesus, right? And his salvation with the Passover, with the blood of the lamb. And with that judgment, God covered the sun and the moon. Again, we see it in Joel. In Joel uh, 2, 30 through 31, Concerning the appointed end times, the Lord said, I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming and the great dreadful day of the Lord. So again, the Bible is saying the day of the Lord will be accompanying with signs in the skies as well. Again, in Luke 23, 44, now is about the sixth hour. This is so significant. Okay, this is talking about Jesus's crucifixion. Luke 23, 44. Now it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. So when Jesus died on the cross, the sun was eclipsed. When God was judging the sins of the world. So with judgment, as God was pouring out his judgment on Jesus, instead of us who deserved it, instead of the thief on the cross who deserved it, he was pouring it out on Jesus. And the sign of the judgment was an eclipse. We have to pay attention to these things. We have to pay attention to these things, especially when it makes a mark over the U.S. And an X. Over the course of seven years. Let's also think about this. The first time the eclipse went across the United States in 2017, it was three and a half years later, COVID hit. And then three and a half years later is seven years and this other eclipse is coming. That speaks of judgment. But here's the good news. When God brings judgment, he always brings mercy. He always brings mercy. In the same way that he poured out judgment on Jesus, he gave mercy to us. In the same way that he poured judgment on the entire earth with flooding it, he gave mercy to Noah. With judgment always comes mercy. And that's the hope of glory when we are his children. So many people believe that this is a sign of coming judgment. There's all this stuff happening in the temple, right? This temp temple is being rebuilt. There's all this stuff happening with the eclipse. It's an election year too. Let's think about that. Crazy things are happening, but when judgment is poured out, so is mercy. So how much more must we be crying out for mercy? How much more should we say, God, we are here for an outpour of your grace? I don't want your wrath, God. I need an outpour of your grace. And how much more should we be testifying to God's grace and testifying to the purity that he brings so that others can be saved? Judgment always comes as a response to sin. And so if judgment's coming as a response to sin, how much more should we who are blood-bought, purified, spirit-filled, be first responders 
and pulling people out of sin and saying, let me show you the way to purity. Let me show you the ark that God already built for us in Jesus. Let me show you how to escape what's coming in Christ. We need to be at the forefront of that. We can't be shrink, shrink, shrink back in fear and say, oh no, God, I'm so afraid of what's coming. I'm so afraid of the Antichrist. I'm so afraid of the end times. I'm afraid of the tribulation. Don't say, no, this is the time to rise up. This is the time where the harvest is ripe. This is when the time where people are going to be saying, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Now is the time. Now is the time to cry out for an outpour of God's grace. It should bring us hope and not fear. And so there are a few more things for me to mention before, before I finish, but we must know that Jesus is coming back to the world to judge it, but also to bring redemption. But first let me paint a picture of what the judgment actually looks like, because a lot of times we can minimize it because it just makes us uncomfortable. But scripture is very clear about what this judgment looks like, which is why we need to be saved, why we need to be serious about getting other people saved, why it's important to be spirit filled and store up on the oil of God. In 2 Peter 3, 3 through 14, it says, above all, be aware of this. Scoffers will come in the last days, scoffing and following their own evil desires, saying, where is this coming that he promised? Ever since our ancestors fell asleep, all things continue as they have been since the beginning of creation. They deliberately overlook this. By the word of God, the heavens came into being long ago, and the earth was brought about by by was brought about from water and through water. Through these, the world of that time perished when it was flooded. But the same word, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are stored up for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Let me pause right there. The earth is being stored up for destruction. That's why there's going to be a new heaven and new earth, because this one's going to pass away and be thrown into the lake of fire. Humans were not made for this kind of wrath and this kind of judgment, but sin caused that wedge. Let me keep going. Dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years is like one day. The Lord does not delay his promise as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. I'll pause right there again. God is showing judgment. This is all appointed for the lake of fire. This is appointed for judgment and mercy. Oh, so you... You're scoffing and mocking that Jesus Christ has not come back yet, but you don't realize the mercy in it. You don't realize I'm delaying judgment so more of you can repent, so more souls can get saved. I'm delaying. So many of us are just so like, we're like, God, I don't want to be your strongest warrior. Jesus, just come back now. But he's being merciful. He didn't come back before you got your brother saved. He's being merciful. He didn't come back before you really stored up the word of God in your child's heart and you knew that they knew the Lord. He's being merciful. What are you doing with the moments and the seconds and the hours that God is giving you? He is slow and patient so that more would repent. It's mercy, not delay. It's mercy. I'll keep going. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are being dissolved in this way, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness as you wait for the day of God to hasten its coming. Because of that day, the heavens will be dissolved with fire and the elements will melt with heat. But based on his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Here's the final statement. Therefore, dear friends, while you wait for these things, make every effort to be found without spot or blemish in his sight at peace. That's the purpose of all of this. The scripture was 2 Peter 3, 3 through 14. That's the purpose of all of this. He's he's being patient as more can come to repentance. The day of the Lord is coming. 
The heavens will be consumed in fire. The earth will be consumed in fire. Sinners who have not given their lives to Jesus will be consumed in fire. Demons will be consumed in fire. Death, hell, and the grave will be consumed in fire. Everything's going up in flames in eternal destruction. And the way to escape it is through purity. The way to escape it is to be found blameless and spotless. And we can't do that on our own. The way to escape it is through Jesus, through the blood of Jesus and through the infilling power of the Holy Spirit. So if you want to be ready for these last days, first of all, you're going to make sure that you're right with the Lord. You're going to make sure I know that I'm saved. I know that if Jesus came back today, if the, the day of the Lord happened while I was asleep, I can stand before God and say, I have somebody who can go before me. I haven't lived an innocent life, but I have somebody who paid the price for me. You want to know that you know that you know that you know the Lord. But also, you want to make sure that you're making the most out of this time. The harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. That's why we need an outpour. That's why we need God to just light us up on the inside. We need to be baptized by fire of the Holy Spirit. And that's the thing. Like God sends an outpour of rain to show his mercy and his kindness of the spirit, right? The, the early rains and the latter rains, but he'll also send an outpour of judgment. Same thing with fire. He's the refiner's fire. There's the fire of the Holy Spirit and then there's the fire of judgment. So you're going to have water and fire regardless, but which one are you going to have? Are you going to have the one that destroys you? Or are you going to have the one that refines you and, and builds you up for the days to come? So when you have the water of God, when you have the fire of God, that's when you can pour into others. You can light other people up. Like the word God said, at the beginning of this call, he said, it's going to be like a small ember that becomes a forest flame. God is sending revival to his people. When the enemy's working, when the enemy's scheming, God is working harder. There is revival coming. There's revival for your household. Get your household right with the Lord. There's revival for your families and your extended families. Reconciliation. Make sure you're forgiving people. Make sure you're doing right by people. Make sure that your heart is clear and conscious and your conscience is clear before the Lord. Make sure you're saying, God, search me, purify my heart. And in that, you're going to be a, a choice vessel for God to use, to pour out into others and make this an incredible mass movement of the Holy Spirit. This is why the outpour is just so incredibly important. We are the temple of the living God. We belong to him and he pours his spirit on us and we become anointed and prepare to endure and to triumph in the last days. Because it's not just about enduring, it's about triumphing. God is saying you will have victory. This is not just making it through the tribulation, making it through the hard times, making it through the end times, just making it into heaven. He's like, no, you will live life and live it to the full. You'll have life and life more abundantly. Do you believe you can actually prosper in times of famine? I even prophesy people, there are some of you who are listening right now who will experience a Joseph anointing. You have felt as if it's been trial after trial after trial, betrayal after betrayal, hit after hit after hit. And you're like, God, where are you? What is this? Where's the vision you gave me? Where's the promise you gave me? And God's saying, I'm setting you up to be able to bless those who cursed you. And I'm setting you up to be in a time of prosperity when the rest of the world is in famine, when the rest of the world is going up in flames, you are going to be like a well of living water. I am setting you up in these last days. Have faith in the Lord because he's on your side. It is also going to make us number our days. Like this awareness of the day of the Lord is approaching. These are the times. It tru These truly are the last days. It's going to help us number our days. Knowing that any delay in Christ's return is a greater opportunity for many to come to repentance. The harvest is plenty. It will be in the last days. God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will see dreams. And when he's saying all this again, I read it earlier. All this stuff's going to happen in the heavens. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood. And then he ends with this. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's the infilling of the Holy Spirit that is going to save you in these last days and save others in the in last days. But we have to ask, what is the context of this scripture? What's the context of the scripture? What just happened before this scripture in Acts 2? 
Type it in the chat. What's the context of this scripture? We already mentioned it earlier. This was just being said after something significant happened in Acts 2. I'll give you a couple more minutes. I know somebody's typing it up, and I want to I want to give you the opportunity to get it. In Acts 2:17, this was quoted right after a significant thing happened. Jan says the upper room. Natasha says Pentecost. Exactly. The upper room. Pentecost. Pentecost. Okay, there's a little bit of delay. Very good. The outpour of the Holy Spirit. This was after the day of Pentecost. Why is this significant? The day of Pentecost led to a major harvest. Okay, let's keep reading. In verse 37, here's what it says. After this was quoted, in verse 37, it says, When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off. Oh, mercy. <laughs> all who are afar off, not those who are close to the Lord, all who are far off. Some of us need to remind ourselves of how far off we were, and his grace was still for us, and his spirit was still for us. And all of you who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call, with many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. 3,000 people. After the day of Pentecost, and they testified to the work of the Lord and saying, this is a work of God. These people are not drunk. This is the power of God. And it is a fulfillment of the scripture. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And the people were pierced. And they're saying, what must we do? He says, repent and be baptized. And 3,000 people came to be saved. That's right. It's the harvest. It's the harvest. Right now in the season, God is speaking, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Will you be ready to receive, but will you also be ready to pour back out? Will you be ready to pour back out? Because there's more than enough. And then right after this, in verse 33, it says, everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. So what followed this was miracles, signs, and wonders. Verse 44 says, now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all, as many as had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoy, enjoying the favor of all people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. So it was Pentecost. You know, I'm going to go back to my vision that I had that I shared with you guys. My vision happened in four parts. First, it was the outpour in my hands. That was number one. Then it was the outpour that fell into the bucket. That was number two. Then it was the outpour of the lake. That was outpour number three, each one getting bigger. And then finally, it began raining. I believe that this is what it looks like in the body of Christ when what happens with a few spreads to many. It started in the upper room, the day of Pentecost. People are lit on fire with the Holy Spirit. And then it poured out to the 3,000. And from the 3,000, every single day, more will be were being added to those who were saved every single day. And then it didn't stop there because then they went to Judea and, and Samaria and the ends of the earth. And now to this day, the gospel is still being spread. And it all started from this little outpour on the day of Pentecost. That is the power of the living God. That is the power of God. That is not a work of flesh. That is not a work of man. That is the power of God. I remember there's a scripture. I don't even know where it is, but there's a scripture um, where people were contemplating opposing the apostles. And then one was like, hey, 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 let's, um, let's back up because if it's not God, It'll fizzle away like all these other false prophets and false messiahs. But if it is God, 
You're going to see yourself working against God himself. And to this day, the gates of hell have not prevailed against the church. The gates of hell will never prevail against God's church because we have an outpour of his Holy Spirit. And I believe he's pouring out right now. There's a great harvest. And so I'll just end with this. We need to prepare. We need to prepare. We need to prepare. We need to get ready to receive the outpour. We need to get excited. We need to get expectant. And here's how. First with purity. Anytime there's a major revival in scripture, but also post scripture, anytime there's a major revival, it comes as a result of repentance. It's not when revival is sought. It's not when revival is the goal. It's when Jesus is the goal and repentance happens. If we want to see revival, we first must get before the Lord and have a contrite and broken spirit before him and say, God, I've been wicked. I've had an, an impure heart. I've been wrong. I've been off. God, I need you. I desperately need you with everything in me. I need you. Cleanse me. Purify me. I repent. I go away from the way that I've been walking. And so it starts with that first inward repentance of I am leaving my old life. I am picking up my cross. I'm following Jesus. I'm giving him my life. He's going to be my savior and my Lord. That's salvation. That's the first repentance. But then there has to be this posture of humility that says, God, I will repent as often as needed because I want to please you. I'll repent as often as needed because I don't want anything to hinder this move of God. I want your outpour. I want to flow in your spirit. I don't want to quench out anything you want to do in my life. I will remain low and pure so that I am a pure vessel for you to flow through. I don't want to be a hindrance to what you're going to do. So purity, purity comes through salvation. Salvation comes through repentance and turning to God. Purity is also from deliverance, okay? We're ushering in an era where we're no longer afraid to confront demons. Demons dwell within people's bodies, even spiritual people who love the Lord. I've seen it. I've had it cast out of me. I've cast it out of others. Demons are real. There are impure spirits that are blocking your ability to receive the more that God has for you. If you haven't already, go on my YouTube channel after this and go and watch my deliverance testimony. So you can know oh, I'm not just pointing fingers. Oh, you need to be delivered. You need No, we need to be cleansed so God can flow through more parts of us. It doesn't separate us from God. It doesn't make us any less a child of God, but it does keep us bound in areas where God is saying, I want to set you free. There is a greater level of abundance. There's a greater level of freedom. You don't even know how good it can be. The gospel is for you and your soul to be saved for all of eternity, but you can also have the fullness of the gospel right now. You can be set free in your everyday experiences if you're willing to surrender and submit yourself. We're, we're ushering into a time of healing and deliverance. Where we're no longer afraid of it in America because it's been happening in all different parts of the world for a while. And it's been happening in these small churches and all of that. But there's going to be a purity, a genuine move of God where it's not for show. And people are saying, I just want to be free and to get free. Also, consecration and Bible reading. I already talked about getting your, your physical Bible, but I'm saying you are eating up the word. Um, and consecration. Guys, you got to have a lifestyle of fasting. A lifestyle of fasting, whether it's a once a month thing, okay, every single month I fast on these days, or a once a week thing, you could do a once a week fast. Um, but it can't be, man, I, the last time I did a fast was two years ago. If the last time you did a fast was two years ago, are you truly picking up your cross and denying yourself to follow Jesus? Because it, it, it requires you to deny your flesh to fast. And so we live in a wicked and perverse generation. And so if we, uh, it, I remember when Jesus said to the disciples, the disciples were like, why couldn't we cast out this demon? And he's like, you, you wicked and perverse generation. You know, these kind come out by prayer and fasting. In some versions, NIV, I don't even read NIV anymore because they take scriptures out. Some 
versions take that scripture out. It just says, come out by prayer. No, no, no. The secret weapon is in prayer and fasting. If you want to have power in the realm of the spirit, if you want demons to tremble, you got to stay in that secret place and consecration, prayer, and fasting. And if you want to be free and pure from a wicked and perverse generation, you want to be set apart, you got to deny yourself through prayer and fasting. Do you see the connection? You get free from a wicked and perverse generation through prayer and fasting. Okay? Consecrate yourself. Having a posture of purity will set you up to prosper in the end. Also, worship. Worship, worship, worship. God just wants our worship. At the end of the day, he wants to say, I'm your God and you're my people. You're my people and I'm your God. Worship me. Worship me. Come to the secret place. Lose yourself in me. And that's why I wrote the outpour. And there's so many other songs that the Lord is bubbling up in me that are in my phone and in my voice memos. I keep sending it to my friend. Ariel, like I keep sending it to my bestie just because I'm like, hey, I have another song idea. I have another song because there's a worship, a movement of worship that's coming forth because with repentance and revival comes just a posture of God. I love you. I adore you. I exalt you. You are worthy. May your posture be worship. Sunday mornings is, is not the only time you should be worshiping. Worship in your car. Worship with your children. Worship when your voice is cracking. You sound bad. Worship when you're crying. Worship the Lord your God. And you will find such fullness of life in that worship. And you will be revived in the spirit. There will be a revival as you pursue God in worship. And that's why I even want to release the outpour for a posture of purity and a posture of worship to sweep across the body of Christ. And also at Confident Woman Weekend 2024 in Houston, the outpour, it is going to be a free flow. It is going to be, we are before the Lord and God, we came to worship you. We came for you to do what you want to do. I'm not even calling anything a schedule for Confident Woman Weekend 2024 because I'm saying, God, you flow. He said, this thing is going to be unscheduled. So I'm like, this is not even the schedule for today. This is the flow for the day because I want the outpour and there's a stream that you have. And I want to be in flow with your stream of consciousness, God. So I'm just going to be in a posture to receive. And I'm going to be in a posture to give, to pour out my oil as you pour out your glory. And I worship you and I adore you. And that's where things happen. That's where you're set free. That, that's where there's deliverance. That's where there's change. That's where God pours out revelation and fresh strategy. That's where God makes kingdom connections. That's where that happens. In that place where we just say, God, I'm here for you and you only. Also purpose. We get ready to receive through purpose. So this is, hey, you have something to do. Yes, your purpose is to magnify the Lord and, and glorify the God. But if you're not bringing anybody else into that, if you're not helping anybody else, what are you doing? <laughs> like the harvest is plenty and the laborers are few and our time is short. And so we need to be making sure we are sharing the gospel God has put you on this earth to do something very specific and you need to be in alignment with your God-given design, not doing what anybody else said that you should be doing, but only doing what God has designed you to do. And it may not even look religious. It may look like you being in your industry, being excellent in your industry because you know you're called to it, but you have to be serving a purpose, walking out in your God-given calling. The earth is the earth is ripe for harvest. So now is the time to fill up on the oil of the Lord. This this is kingdom living. So this is also part of purpose, right? This is make sure your children are safe. Make sure you and your husband or you and your wife are on good terms. Make sure that you have forgiven others. Make sure, hey, if you if you believe some of the things that are coming, okay, let's make sure that you're saving up money using kingdom principles, kingdom money principles. I'm going to be a lender and not the borrower, right? Above only and not be, not beneath. I'm going to store, I'm going to buy some land. I'm going to I'm going to start farming, kingdom living, doing things differently than the right the way that the rest of the world does. Now's the time to do that. Now's the time to get free. If God is saying, "Hey, I've called you to be an entrepreneur." 
to make your own money so that nobody else can silence you because you can be paid off and nobody else can silence you because you could easily lose your job. If God is calling you to that, now's the time to do that and to step out into that purpose and to step out into that calling so that when God needs you to do something, when God needs you to speak, when God needs you to be in a light in the dark place, nobody can silence you. My husband and I, we work for ourselves. He owns his own company. I lead Confident Women Co. I speak. I content create. Nobody can control me. I don't even do brand deals. So there's nothing I can do that can muzzle my voice. And that's something that God built up in me through the avenue of entrepreneurship. This is kingdom living. It's like being a Joseph. It's like being a Daniel. You can be in the world, but have influence over it because you can't be controlled. You can't be silenced. Now's the time for kingdom living. Equip the church. Fulfill your assignment. Now is also the time for warfare. This is war. There is a great battle taking place in the heavenlies. It's a lot happening up there. And so this is the time to put on the full armor of God. You got to make sure that you put on your helmet of salvation, your sword of the spirit, your belt of truth, your breastplate of righteousness. You got your feet fitted with the shoes that bring the gospel of peace. You are in that thing. You're ready to strike and you're going to resist the devil and he's going to flee. But if he strikes, you're going to strike back and he's going to really regret ever striking. He's really going to regret it because you have the power of God on your side because you were consecrated and you were living in the kingdom way and you were equipped for battle. Oh my goodness. We are going to have some snipers in the spirit. Y'all going to be some bad mama jammas in the spirit. Okay. Now's the time for that. Now's the time to where it's like, you know, Paul, we know Jesus, we know, but who are you? Like, that's not going to be said about you. It's going to be like, oh yeah, we know, we know Josephine. We know Josephine, she's wreaking havoc on the kingdom of hell and demons tremble because she comes in the name of the Lord and she comes with the full armor of God. That is the season we're walking into to prepare for the outpour. We got to be so spiritually tight, okay? We cannot let our guards down and that's where fasting comes in. That's where praying comes in. That's where prayer groups, it's an era of prayer groups. And I don't even want to say pr an era. I want to see, I want to say a new generation of prayer warriors where we're actually getting in prayer groups and regularly praying with others. This is a covenant prayer. Some of you guys need to go back and watch the James Kowagi testimony. I know probably 80% of you have already seen it. If you haven't seen it, go and watch the James Kowagi testimony. But if you have, go back and watch it so you can be reminded of how powerful prayer is. There were agents of darkness that were trying to infiltrate a church because there were just a few banded together praying in Africa and they couldn't ish, they couldn't usher in a, a world agenda, a demonic world agenda. Like the, the satanic elites, they couldn't usher it in because a small group of people who were faithfully praying in covenant and they had to send so many agents of darkness just to infiltrate this group to get them to be divided. That's the power of prayer. If you would just gather together with others, you will be a fortified wall. That is the power of prayer. That is what we need to walk into in this next season. And what's the result? If you do all of these things, if you're walking in purity, salvation, repentance, daily repentance, deliverance, consecration, Bible reading, worship, purpose, sharing the gospel. You fill up on the oil of the Lord. You walk in your kingdom assignment. You handle your money right. You do right by people. You walk in warfare. You are waging war on the, on the elements of darkness. What is the result? Revival. Revival. We don't seek revival. We seek God. And when we seek God like this, with this level of intensity, when we're saying, God, we're here for your outpour, we're here for you and nothing else, revival's a result. Mark my words. We saw the former rains in the early church, but the latter rains are coming. God is pouring out his spirit like never before. It's never before because this is a fresh outpour and we have to be ready to receive it. And so I want to invite you to come to Confident Women Weekend 2024 in Houston. On August 30th and 31st, God is going to meet us with his manifest presence. He's going to pass through and he's going to do whatever he wants to do. And we're going to let him do whatever he wants to do. 
and it's going to be absolutely powerful and it's going to light a flame for a greater outpour. And just two days, I'm releasing the song, The Outpour. And my ask of you is to get this song in your spirit. Have it on replay. Play it over and over and over again until you know the words by heart. Sing it out. Let it be a heart song. On my way to pick up my daughter to school today for the first time in forever, uh, because, you know, I've been listening to it so much with, you know, the final revisions and mixing and mastering. I've been listening to it so much that I was listening with it with a critical musical ear. But for the first time in forever, I just sung the song, no music, just me and God in the car. And I was brought to just nothing in the best way, just brought to tears by the presence of God saying, God, I, you're my sole purpose and I need you and I want you. You have to breathe. You have to do the work in my life. You have to bring the harvest that's coming, God. And in that, there's just such a a deep stirring that the Lord's doing. My prayer for you and my ask of you is to get that song deep in your heart and let it be a prayer of your heart that bubbles up in worship. And I have no problem making that ask because the song is God's song at the end of the day. He he sprung it up out of my soul and I truly believe he wants that to be a prayer of our hearts as a people in this season, in this hour. And then my other ask of you is just to share it. Share it with others. Let it be a wildflower wildfire, let it be a, a flame, let it be like Pentecost where, you know, it just continues. Like God's presence is meeting people where they're at. That's what I ask of you. And the last thing I would say is just get ready to receive because God is about to do this thing. And just like the vision I shared with you, it is going to be so much more than we even anticipate. So just get ready, buckle up because the outpour is coming. So let me pray for you. I'll probably stay on about 10 more minutes. I think I made good time. I'm really pleased. I was like, hopefully this is not a two hour call. I'm going to pray and I'll stay maybe like 10 more minutes for just like questions and all of that. And um, then I'll say good night. Father, I thank you that you are faithful. God, I thank you for your salvation. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your presence. God, you are so good. Lord, I thank you that we don't ever have to conjure up praise because you're so worthy of praise. It's so easy to praise you. You're so good and faithful and pure and kind and merciful and just God. Lord, I pray that you would equip us for what's coming. Lord, I ask that you would bring an outpour as we come to you in the secret place. Lord, I pray that it wouldn't be a performance or a show, but God, we would just want you. May we be people who say, God, we want you. We want you. We want you more than anything. We want you, the person of Jesus, God. We want to be lost in your presence. We want to be drenched in your love. We want to be one with you. And from that place, God, I pray it would overflow. In the same way you showed me in the vision with my hands, it overflows into something that cannot be contained. May this be something that's intimate with each and every one of us, a personal walk with each and every one of us, something special to each and every one of us. But God, it would pour out and become the latter rains. God, it would become the move of your spirit. It would become the harvest that you spoke about revival that we haven't seen before. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do. We thank you that you equip your people for every single good work. And we ask for your mercy. We ask for your grace. We ask for your goodness. We ask for your glory and your power. Lord, pour it out in this season. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen, y'all. Well, man, I have really enjoyed tonight with y'all. This has been so life-giving to me. Um, and I, I love reading all of your guys' comments. If you guys have any questions, now is a great time to ask. And I'm going to go ahead and drop in the chat. In the description box below is the link to the conference as well. I'm going to type that in the chat as well um, so that you guys can come to the conference. It's going to be incredible. Another really cool thing about the conference is that um, conference hold on conference another really cool thing about the conference is that it's being held at a church that's called the fountain of praise and it was the venue that god chose i didn't choose the venue it's just he he handed it over to us and i just love that because if you're looking for an outpour you got to go to a fountain i'm telling you god has been weaved into every single detail 
Natasha Dore says, do you have any deliverance tools, resources that can be used? Yeah. So my suggestion to you whenever it comes to deliverance is um, go watch the James Kowalki testimony if you haven't. I think this is just good for you to know and consume. So you just understand spirit, like the spiritual realm and how it works from somebody who's been pulled out of darkness. Another great resource is Bev Tucker has a book that is called like a deliverance manual. So go to Amazon and type in Bev Tucker, B-E-V Tucker, normally spelled Bev Tucker deliverance manual. Go and buy that deliverance manual as well. Um, another good book to read is, uh, deliverance from, co uh, deliverance from covenants and curses, uh, by James. Oh God. His last name is slipping me. James, Reverend James Solomon, go and get that book. Um, deliverance from demonic curses and covenants by, uh, Reverend James Solomon. That's another great book to read as well. Um, so if you do that and also pair that with prayer, dependence on the Holy Spirit. Make sure you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. If you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit, I have a video on my channel on the baptiz baptism of the Holy Spirit as well. That's pretty in depth. And then the last thing is the Bible. So if you do all those things, scripture, those testimonies, those books, um, I think you're going to be pretty equipped for, for deliverance. Aw, thanks. Thanks for being on, Kamisha. Um, Taz says, how can I find a true believer to help me with deliverance? Um, you know, it can be tricky sometimes just because there are only a few people who are equipped for it. Um, but my suggestion to you is to first pray before I received my deliverance. I prayed to the Lord for freedom in specific areas. And I didn't know that it was deliverance that I needed, but I was like, God, I really need freedom in these areas. I don't know how I'm going to get free, but Lord, like I pray that you show me how and he will bring it. Do not understand that. Do not underestimate the power of prayer. So if you're seeking deliverance, if there's someone, you know, who operates in it, ask them, but first ask God, the scripture says, ask and you shall receive, seek and you will find knock and the door will be answered for you. will be open for you. Ask God because he wants you to be free more than you want to be free. So if you ask God, God, send me somebody who's a faithful deliverance minister who's not going to, you know, leave me worse off than I was before. I trust that he'll show you that person and he'll provide. Hello says, hello, Noel, Noel Wazi says, how uh, did you mention when the song drops? It drops in two days, two days. I'm dropping it on my YouTube channel and it's going to be on streaming platforms under confident worship, confident worship worship. It is going to go, if you came to this live stream for my email list, it's going to be sent to your email inbox. If you're not in my email list, what are you doing? Uh, but if you're just subscribed to my channel, if this is your first time on my channel or anything like that, it's going to be uploaded to my YouTube channel and you'll be able to find it on other streaming platforms as well. The outpour. Uh, Miranda Cruz says, what time is the conference at? The time, uh, the conference is on August 30th and 31st, starts at 9 a.m. Um, and then on the 31st, we'll be done by about 8. Bratcher says, I got my ticket a month ago. I'm ready for the outpour and the Fountain of Praise is a good church. Yay! I'm so excited to see you there. I am so ready. I am so excited for this conference. Like, so expectant. I have just the joy of the Lord with it. Um, Konisha, Con Konisha, maybe, um, I'm not sure if I'm saying your name correctly. I, I like to say names correctly, but um, you said, how do you suggest we overcome the fear of attacks to go forward again? If you've been brutally attacked and traumatized in the past by being obedient. Hmm. The first thing I would say is seek the Lord for healing and the mental shifts you need to move forward because God is so faithful and kind and gentle. Like one of the, one of the characteristics of our God is he's gentle and he's kind and he's a good counselor better than any therapist you could ever have. And I believe in therapy, but God is the ultimate therapist. And if you've been traumatized and brutally attacked and you fear going forward, I believe that there's some healing that needs to take place. There's a healing video on my YouTube channel 
it's life changing. And I'm not saying it's life changing just because it's mine. It's life changing because the concepts in it, I actually got from another book that changed my life. And so go to my YouTube channel and um, there's a video called um, something like emotional healing, like steps for emotional healing. Um, go and watch the, the video and actually walk through the steps and do that with Jesus. And if you want to walk through it with your therapist, if you want to feel more comfortable. Um, but I believe that you feeling the confidence to move forward is going to be a, a part of just like the Holy Spirit and conviction to move forward. But a big piece of it's going to be healing, and I and healing is for you. God's outpour isn't just for miracles and signs and wonders for outward expression, but it's also for inward healing, and He wants to do that for you. Now, Shanika says, "What Bible version do you use?" I use the She Reads Truth Study Bible, which is a CSB Bible. Uh, let's see, She Reads Truth CSB. Anytime I do my challenges, I always do CSB as well. Um, CSB is pretty biblically accurate. Um, I often, um, if I'm not sure what the original translation of something says, and I'm like, oh, I'm not sure if, you know, because sometimes versions can be very different. Sometimes they're extremely similar or identical, but sometimes versions can be very different and seem like they have very different meanings. I'll go to, um, I'll type in Bible Hub Interlinear interlinear. I'll type that in and there's an interlinear tool and I'll type in whatever scripture I need. And, um, then you're going to be able to pull up the scripture in its original language and you can go word by word and find the exact word you're looking for and say, Oh, this is the word in the Greek, or this is the word in the Hebrew. Um, and so my foundational translation of scripture I do is CSB and if I'm ever unsure about the meaning of something, I'll use the interlinear tool um, to know what the exact translation should be. So I get the meaning. Yes. Let's see. Speak Truth Publishing says, Amanda, I have an activity book for children and teens that will help God's children know the true superhero and help them build their faith and him during these times. I'll share more if you like. That is phenomenal. We need more and more of that in this time. My kids love like Christian shows and everything, and they have their own Bibles, and they like love Christian books, and that is just so necessary because a lot of this stuff has witchcraft in it these days. Like the majority of it, Disney, it's a lot of witchcraft. It's a lot of darkness. It's a lot of transgender. It's a lot of, a lot of that stuff. I don't want to be censored on YouTube, but it's a lot. Um, Regina says, so, so grateful for this word tonight. I love you, Regina. I'm glad. Yay. Um, Sasha says, bought my ticket by faith. Praying God will pray, provide the plane ticket on a hotel. Sasha, God will provide the plane ticket and hotel. God will, because when you match him in that level of faith, when you actually step out, that's when the power of God goes out. We see that with the woman of the issue of blood. It wasn't until she stepped out to touch him that the power of God went out. Same thing with Peter walking on water. He stepped out and the power of God met him there. And so when we step out in faith, that's when God does the miraculous. When we don't see the miraculous of God in our lives, we have to ask, are we stepping out in faith? And so I'm so proud of you for getting your ticket. I can't wait to see you there and be like, oh my gosh, you're Sasha. Give me a big hug. It's going to be amazing. I'm glad you're going to be there. Um, skinny bones says, how can people with health issues fast? I have non-diabetic hypoglycemia, so I'm not able to fast as I have to eat every three to four hours to keep my blood sugar up. Um, if I were you, I would ask the Lord about it. I would ask the Lord about it. Um, because that's something that the Lord and maybe a health physician, um, would be able to answer because I, I can't speak to the health things. Um, but I do know that regardless of if you can go without food or not, you can definitely consecrate yourself and definitely crucify your flesh with food. Like right now I'm doing paleo and I'm like, I really need to do paleo because my skin was popping. And right now my zits are popping. <laughs> like, like, then this is from all the sugar I've been eating. And I'm like, okay, I'm obviously not crucifying my flesh. So I'm doing paleo. Um, and so there are different ways for you to consecrate yourself or just crucify your flesh um, so that you're not a slave to your flesh if you can't go without, without eating. 
Um, so I'll say that. Eliza loves Bible Hub. Eliza is a whole Bible scholar. Um, AJ Whetstone says, thank you for your time and confidence in God. It's inspiring. We see God and you keep going. Looking forward to your second conference. Yay. I can't wait to see you at the conference, AJ. It's going to be amazing. Um, love your neighbors. What do you think about NIV or new King James versions? I love new King James version. I grew up on NIV, but I detest NIV now. At first I was like, oh, it's not that deep. Like as long as you're reading the Bible, um, but you know, we go from faith to faith, glory to glory. So if you start there, you know, praise the Lord. I'm not going to judge, you know, and praise the Lord. You're still reading the Bible. But at the end of the day, NIV takes out scriptures. And sometimes the words that are used are drastically different than the original word used. And I'm just like, this seems intentional. Um, I don't like it. And so I just, I don't recommend NIV. Um, new King James version is pretty accurate. Um, New King James Version is quite similar to CSB. Um, I love how New King James Version reads as well. It's really good. King James, I can't do it. But New King James is really good, honestly. Um, Your Milk and Honey says, what does it mean if you keep asking God something, not for something, but a genuine question, but he is quiet and you're not getting any dreams? Um. There are so many different factors that can go into it. So many different factors. The first one that comes to mind is, and I'm not projecting this onto you. I'm just thinking through all the various things. One of the things is it could be that your prayers are hindered. So there are a few things that hinder your prayers. Unforgiveness hinders your prayers. Um, it says, hey, if you go to make an offering before the Lord, but you have an ought against your brother, just leave it and go and and make right with your brother, right? Like being like, if God, if you don't forgive others, God will not forgive you. Like your prayers will be hindered if you're walking in unforgiveness. So make sure that you are operating in forgiveness and your heart is clean and pure whenever it comes to that. Um, uh, another thing could be, there may be a different question that the Lord wants you to ask. Sometimes when I seek the Lord with a specific question and he's silent, He's showing me you're not asking the right question. And we see this in the life of Jesus in scripture. Like many times when Jesus was questioned, he would question the question. He would question the person asking the question because they're not asking the right question. So it could be that there's a different or deeper revelation that he wants you to grasp. And maybe you need to stop asking him that question and ask him something else. Maybe there's something else he wants you to know. Um, Another thing is it could also be like there needs to be a breaking through in prayer as well. Sometimes there are spiritual things that are being held up in the heavenlies. We see this. Um, I think it was in the book of Daniel. Y'all can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, where I believe Daniel was praying, but the prayer wasn't being answered as quickly because there were there were uh, celestial beings that were holding back that word to go forth and the angels were contending with it. And so sometimes there are things being held up in the heavenlies and it's a call to pray more. It's a call to intercession. Um, and so I actually believe that there's a breakthrough that's going to happen in the spirit. That's what I prayed. The One of the very first things I prayed for on this call is for God would take the, uh, the muffles off the ears and he would take the blinders off the eyes because there has been a great blockage and it's a spiritual thing. Sometimes that comes by deliverance. Like we need to be delivered from, from these blockages. Um, there's a lot of things, a lot of factors that can go into that. Um, and then another thing is maybe God just wants your focus to be somewhere else. Um, so I want whatever God wants for you. And it could be a myriad of things. There's so many different things that can impact that. But those are a few that come to mind. Um, Taz says, will you be updating your podcast anytime soon? I love all the episodes. Um, and will there be Confident Woman merch at the conference? Yes, there will be Confident Woman merch at the conference, um, just like there was last time. And I don't plan on uh, updating my podcast because the Lord has me focusing on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, and email whenever it comes to the content I create. Um, I'll be honest, whenever I started the podcast, I didn't begin with the end in mind. Um, I was thinking this is a good idea versus this is a God idea. 
Um, and so I want to sustain every good work that God started in me and God started this YouTube channel. Um, and so if you want to receive from me like more messages, um, I just suggest you listen to my YouTube channel and um, other content that I have. Um, and so, yes. And who knows? Maybe God will bring that back someday. Just not just not now. Um Gemily says, how did you say we should live by the spirit, not the flesh, yet not feel guilty for some food pleasure, putting God first, of course. I mean, God, God invented pleasure, you know, like, like he invented delight. He, you know, like food is meant to taste good, right? He's, we don't need to eat in heaven, but we're still going to feast in heaven. We're going to feast with God. And so it's not a sin to delight in food. In fact, God designed it that way. Um, But it is sinful to be a slave to it in such a way that you can't say no. Um, In such a way to where it's like impacting you and affecting you and you can't tell yourself no. That's when we're feeding our flesh and we're being just led by our flesh. And so I believe that's an easy fix. It's just a lifestyle of prayer and fasting. And so you can enjoy the good things in life and you can enjoy different foods. Like God made it to be enjoyable. Um, But, you know, the first sin was through eating, right? It was through eating something. And so if you can crucify King's stomach, you'll be a bad mamma jamma. Ebony's not a fan of NIV either, girl. I get it. It's good to see you, Ebony. Um, your milk and honey says, what's the difference between a seer and a prophet? Seers and prophets are both prophets. Um, the difference is that there are different types of prophets. There are some prophets that are primarily hearing prophets. They heard a word of the Lord. There's some prophets that are primarily seeing prophets. They see visions. They have dreams, maybe open visions. Um, So the prophet John in the book of Revelation is definitely a seer because he's like, I see dragons. I see the woman, um, the harlot and the nine horns or, you know, seven horns, all this. Like they're seeing these vivid visions. Um, Daniel's a seer. And so it's not that there's a difference between a seer and a prophet. All all seers are prophets, but not all prophets are seers. So hopefully that answers your question. NIV is not inspired version. I agree, Eliza. It is not. It is not. Um, Abby says, how would you recommend we approach April 8th? God willing, we are here that day. I would say approach it with joy and gladness because you belong to the Lord and he's pouring out your grace. I would say be worshipful, be joyful, be expectant because God's going to do something in the body of Christ because When there's judgment, there's also mercy. And so get excited for what he's going to do in the spirit. Um, I wouldn't dread that day or be afraid of it at all. It's just a sign that we're in the end. That's all. That's what I would say. Things may change in America. I do believe that there's, there's a shifting happening in our nation, a big shifting happening in our nation, but we don't have to be afraid. Um, We just got to be spiritually prepared more than anything and be expectant for God. Which version of the Bible do you favor most? I remember you mentioning, just can't remember, CSB. I read CSB. Um, I really like how NLT reads. It's very comfortable to read. It's very conversational and it's very colloquial in how I understand it. I don't gravitate towards NLT the way I used to. Um, but if there's ever a scripture where it's like, man, this is kind of hard to comprehend in, in CSB or New King James Version, then I'll read it in the NLT just to understand that the stream of consciousness and then go back to my, my versions. Um, cause sometimes, sometimes it can just be harder to comprehend. Eliza said, okay, I'm about to go see the Lord's face to bed. I'm so encouraged. Love you so much. Love you so much too, girl. Um, angel cat says it's in Daniel. Thank you so much. Um, I thought it was in Daniel Prince of Persia, Prince of Persia. Thank you, Michael fighting Prince of Persia. Thank you. Um, Awesome. Worship recommendations. I am really loving Legacy Nashville. If you're talking about worship groups, Legacy Nashville, incredible music. Go look up Legacy Nashville. Um, I'm also really liking Mercy Culture, Mercy Culture Worship. 
Um, go look up Mercy Culture as well. Incredible worship, very pure. Um, and then uh, confident worship in a couple days <laughs> with the outpour. More songs coming soon. <laughs> Um, Yuka Fry says, are there any ways you can know for sure you're walking God's purpose for your life and dealing with trials versus being outside of God's will and the consequences of that? Yeah, I would say that if you are, if you're right with the Lord, there's really a checklist you can go through. Like I'm reading the word of God and I'm weighing my life decisions by the word of God. I'm praying. I pray every day. I begin my day with prayer. I'm praying. I'm a friend of God. I'm constantly in prayer. Maybe I'm in prayer groups. Uh, I'm plugged into a church and I'm regularly receiving from church. And I consult with God on my decisions. I ask him about these things. I don't make rash decisions, but I move as I feel like he's leading me to. Um, I ask God his opinion. I have wise counsel to where when I'm not sure I can bounce things off of them. Like if you have all of those in place and you're doing your best, you're walking by the spirit. Like there's not a world to where it's going to be like, oh yeah, you were seeking my face daily. You were reading the Bible daily. You were surrounded by godly community. You're plugged into a church home. You were seeking me. You really wanted to do my will. You really wanted to know what my will is. And then you miss him. There's not a world where that exists. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And he's going to reward you with his presence and reward you with the right path. And so just do away with that fear of like missing God in that. Like so many people who God called in the Bible are just like people who are living their regular everyday lives. Um, and so just start expecting God to meet you where you're at in your ordinary everyday life. Um, and also trust that if God needs to reroute you or if you're going super far astray, rebuke you or anything, he's a good father and he disciplines his children. So if you were going astray, he would do something to make it obvious. Maybe he'll bring a scripture to where you realize, oh my goodness, I'm walking in sin. Maybe he'll bring somebody in your life to say, hey, have you considered this other avenue? I don't think that this is the wisest thing to go. Have you considered this slight, slight tweak? Like God is so faithful. He won't let you go astray. Um, if you're genuinely trying to get it right. So that's what I would say. Um, yeah, Ashley, we talked about April 8th and the solar eclipse. There's a solar eclipse happening in six days, almost five now. Um, so yeah, just look into that. You can watch the beginning of this video as well. Um, thanks, Amanda. God bless you. When I'm a woman of God, this is super fruitful. Bless you, confident woman community. Good night, everyone. That is a perfect close tonight. to tonight. I had the best time, y'all. If there's anybody you know who would benefit from this live stream, send it to them. Share this live stream. Don't forget to register for the conference. Tickets are only $47. They're not going to be $47 for much longer. Probably after tonight, the price is going up. I'm pretty sure. Uh, I got to double check that, but I'm pretty sure it's going up after tonight. So get your tickets now before the price goes up um and stream the outpour get it in your spirit and just be expectant for what god is gonna do i love you guys so much have a great night